If you have your Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, please join me in the book of Matthew and go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 14 all the way through 21 this morning. So that video that you just saw was a video talking about the International Mission Board. And um, every single year around this time, we take up what is known as the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. Not just our church, but Southern Baptist churches all over America and really all over the world. And you might be asking yourself this question, well, what's all that about? Who, who is this Lottie Moon? Well, Lottie Moon was um, a missionary to the nation of China for some 40 years in the late 1800s on into the early 1900s. And she was there for 40 years giving her life to, to the, the people there in China. And every single year, we take up an international Christmas offering that goes directly to international missionaries and their families. And that video is just one example of missionaries who are living all over the world who are supported by you, who are supported by us as a church and by Southern Baptists all over America and really all over the world. And we would ask that you would consider this Christmas season giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And again, this, these resources, these finances go directly to these people. It goes directly to the Amazon. It goes directly to places in, in hard-to-reach Europe. It goes directly to East Asia, places all over the world. How cool would it be if every single person in our church participated in giving towards the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? And you might say to me or to yourself, Man, I just cannot give that much this year, and we understand that. This has been a very interesting year, but what if you gave $5 or, or $10 or $20? We have envelopes that look like this in the seat backs that are in front of you and out in our foyer, really all over our church. Would you consider giving towards the Lottie Moon Christmas offering either today or next Sunday or sometime before the year is up, and these finances will go directly to impacting the nations for Jesus Christ. And if you would like to know more about Lottie Moon and the International Mission Board, which is a Southern Baptist entity, it's our entity for reaching the nations. There's a website that's listed there. It's also in your bulletin. I would encourage you to go and to look that up and to just learn a little bit about the International Mission Board and also the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. What I want to do right now before we enter really deeply into this text is I just want to read verses 18 through 21 for us. Matthew chapter 12, and I want to just read verses 18 through 21 to set up our time today. The text says this, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Would you pray with me? And God, we come before your throne this morning declaring this truth in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have hope. Lord, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in our world. There's a lot going on in our country. There's a lot going on in our state. There's a lot going on in our community. Father, there's a lot going on in our church. And Lord, we look to you today and we declare this truth, that hope is found in you alone. God, we have people in our church who've had a rough year. God, I pray that you would remind them today that you're with them, that you're right here with them. Father, we have people who are in our church, even today, who are struggling. We have people in our church today who are sick. God, I ask and pray today that you would bring healing to them. God, I ask and pray that they would just be, be reminded of just your great love for them and your great plan for them and your great goodness today. Father, help us just to leave this place 
God, in just a little while, rejoicing. God, being reminded of celebrating the great hope that we have in Christ. Father, if there's anybody that's watching online today or anybody that's in this place today, that just, God, they really just need to be reminded of just your goodness, of your grace, of your kindness, of your mercy, God, of your hope, a hope that is true, a hope that is sure. Father, I ask and pray that they would feel that today, that they would be reminded of that today, that you bring hope, and that the hope that you offer is certain and it is sure. God, we love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you so much for your incredible word. Speak to our hearts this day. We love you, God. And all God's people said, amen. amen. <clears throat> 700 years before Jesus was even born, Isaiah prophesied, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And the Israelites and the religious leaders during the days of Jesus, they knew about these prophecies. They knew about the coming Messiah. You see, they were expecting his arrival, but they were expecting someone different than Jesus. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were expecting a conquering king to arrive on the scene. They were not expecting a humble servant. Now, the Old Testament did say that Jesus Christ was coming and that he was coming to reign, but not on his first arrival. You see, on his first arrival, Jesus would come as a humble baby and as a suffering servant. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that. And on his second arrival, Jesus will come as a conquering king to set up his kingdom rule and reign on the earth. Revelation 19 tells us that. So the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were not expecting a humble servant. Again, they were expecting a conquering king, and this is why they did not accept Jesus. The context of this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today, Matthew 12, the context is the Sabbath day. You see, Jesus and his disciples are picking grain and eating this grain on the Sabbath day. Why? Well, because they are hungry. Also in this context, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. And he does this again on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders were like, what are you doing to Jesus and his disciples? You are, you're breaking all of our customs. You are breaking all of our religious rules. You see, they did not understand Jesus. Again, they wanted someone different. They wanted a conquering king, one whom would defeat all of their enemies. They did not want a humble servant at that time. Verse 14, it says, look at it with me. It says, so the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Why? Because they were threatened by Jesus. Again, Jesus did not fit the mold of what they were wanting in a Messiah. Verse 15, look at it with me. It says, Jesus, aware of this, it says that he withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all. You see, this is what Jesus came to do the first time, the very first time on his first arrival, Jesus, he came to heal. He, he came to serve. He came to help others. He came to offer hope. He came to give new life. So Jesus says in verse 16, it says, he ordered them not to make him known. Begs this question, why did Jesus do that? 
Why did Jesus say not to make him known? The reason why is this. Jesus did not want them to set him up as an earthly king. Again, that's not what he came for the first time. The very first time he came, he came in humility to die. Look at verse 17. It says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. In this text, verses 18 all the way through 21, this is it's a reference to Isaiah chapter 42. Again, remember that all of the Old Testament, it points to the coming Son of God. Verse 18, here's the prophecy from Isaiah that Matthew is referencing to. It says, and we've already read it, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And this is the prophecy of Jesus. The prophecy of Jesus that he was going to be a servant. He was going to come to be a servant to proclaim justice to the Gentiles. What does this mean? This means that Jesus not only came for the Jewish people who would accept him as the Messiah, this means that Jesus came for the nations. He, he came for everyone. He came for you and I. Verse 19, continuing in this prophecy from Isaiah that Matthew is referencing to, it says, He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. What does this mean? This means that Jesus did not come to start a riot. He didn't come to start a fight. He didn't come to start a revolution or to set up his kingdom. He didn't come to crush his enemies. Now the second time he comes, he will do these things. Once he raptures the church and after a time of tribulation, Revelation 19 tells us that Jesus Christ will come back to the earth to crush his enemies, to set up his kingdom. But the first time he came, again, he came to serve. He came to give hope. He came to give eternal life. He came ultimately to die on a cross for your sin and for my sin. Verse 20, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. What is all of this about? You see, a reed is for making Music. A wick is for lighting a candle. And if a musical reed gets worn out or a candle wick is about to go out, what do we normally do? Well, we throw out the reed and we get a new one. We throw out the candle or we throw out the candle wick and we get a new one. You see, Jesus does not do this with people. You see, Jesus does not throw out the bruised, the worn out, the messed up person. What does he do? He restores them. And this morning, you might think that this is you. You might think that you are a bruised reed or a worn out candle wick, ready to be thrown out with no purpose. But this is not true. Not according to Jesus. You see, Jesus, he came to restore you to use you for his glory not to throw you out a bruised reed he will not break a smoldering wick he will not quench he will not throw out write this truth down jesus came to give hope to the world look at verse 21 Matthew ends quoting this prophecy from Isaiah like this. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Jesus came to give hope to the world. And if you only hear one thing today, I would encourage you to hear this truth, that Jesus came to give hope to the world. If you're taking notes in your bulletin, if it's me, I'm circling that great truth. I'm circling that today. In his name, we will hope 
Who are the Gentiles? This is you and I. One of my favorite theologians, his name is Ray Ortland. If you don't know who Ray Ortland is, I, I would encourage you to go and Google his name and to jump on his website. He is just an incredible theologian. But he recently said this, <coughs> excuse me, he says, Christian, do not wring your hands and moan. Oh, what is the world coming to? He says, look to Jesus and rejoice, saying, look who has come into the world. You see, Jesus Christ, he came to give the world hope. And whenever the world speaks of hope, there is an unsureness that comes with it. Here is the, de the secular definition of hope. It is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. It's like this. It's like, I hope I have a job tomorrow. I hope my car starts today. I hope my kids behave in Walmart. I hope we have a mild winter. I hope the Cowboys can just win a game this year. I hope my president wins. I hope the new vaccine that's coming out really does work. I hope that COVID-19 goes away. You see, the secular idea of hope is a longing for something to happen without the sureness that it is going to happen. But whenever the Bible speaks of hope, there is a certainty that it will happen. This is the biblical definition of hope. It's to wait for salvation with joy and full confidence. You see, church family, we can have full joy and confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, we need the government, but our hope is not in the government. We need a vaccine for COVID-19, but our ultimate hope is not even in a vaccine. It's smart and wise to save for retirement, but our hope is not in our bank accounts. You see, presidents... Governmental leaders will come, will come and go. We are praying and begging God for COVID-19 to go away. But it may take a while. The stock market could crash today and we could lose everything that we've ever worked for. You see, church family, the only hope that we have is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only thing. Jesus Christ is the only person. He is the only one that we can have total confidence in. If you only hear one thing today, hear this, that Jesus Christ came to give hope to the world. And whenever the Bible speaks of hope, it is certain. It is true. It will come to pass. Write this great truth down. Jesus Christ gives me hope for today. He gives me hope for today. My son asked me yesterday, he said, Daddy, do you think 2020 will go down in the history books? I said, son, I think you're right. <laughs> I think it will. It's been a pretty interesting year, right? It's been a, a crazy year. I would venture to say that for, for many of you, it's been probably one of the most stressful years that you've ever lived through. For me personally, just you know, serving in ministry now for, for 17 plus years, it's been by far the most stressful year of ministry for me personally. It's just, it's been an interesting year. 2020, COVID-19, we've had things like riots going on all over our country, all over the world. We've had protests going on all over the world. We've had things like political, you know, craziness in this, this political season that we just, just came through in electing a new president. And we understand all of these things, all of these, these crazy things that have gone on this past year. But again, I want to remind us of what Dr. Ortland said just recently. Look who has come into the world. Who? 
Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ, He has come into the world and He is above all of these things. He is above 2020. He's greater than all that has happened in 2020. Look who has come into the world. The Son of God. Jesus Christ. Jesus gives hope for today. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, he calls believers, you and I, the church, he says, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. What does this mean? What does it mean to rejoice in hope? It means to be glad. It, it means to be cheerful and to have total confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, church family, because of the hope that we have, we can be patient in tribulations that come our way, as Paul tells us to do there in Romans chapter 12. Because of the hope that we have in the person of Jesus Christ, we can be patient in this season of just craziness. This COVID-19 season, knowing that, that God is in control. Knowing that God is doing a work because of the, the hope that we have. We can pray for our country. We can pay, pray for our nation. We can pray for the world for the riots and the protests that have been going on in our country. Because of the hope that we have, we can trust our God with all of the election results. You see, Jesus Christ, He gives hope for today. Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And he says the same thing. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, church family, because of Jesus, we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and what He offers the world through His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus Christ gives hope for today. I want to remind you, Today, church family, those of you who are in this place, those of you who are watching online as Jesus Christ gives hope for you today, I want to tell you that Jesus will provide for you today. Jesus Christ provides. I love how Eugene Peterson, he phrases, how he phrases Matthew chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. Just listen to what he says. He says, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen. Don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do what's best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. To not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way He works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how He works. He says, steep your life in God reality, in God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. Any of y'all ever done that before? Every single day. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. He says, God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Jesus Christ, He gives hope for today. Jesus Christ, He will provide for you today. Jesus Christ, he protects. He watches over you today. Jesus Christ, He cares about the smallest and tiniest little detail of your life and everything in between. Luke chapter 12, it tells us that the, the hairs on your head are all numbered. And if, if every hair on your head is numbered, this means that Jesus Christ cares about every single detail of your life. Again, Jesus, He gives hope for today. He provides, He protects. He cares about the smallest details of your life. And all things are possible with Jesus. We remember that great passage of Scripture that we've all, excuse me, we've all read and quoted many times from Matthew chapter 28, which says, 
You know, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We call that the Great Commission. What a very just important verse for us to understand and to memorize and to practice out. But so often, we forget that line before that, which says this in Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus says to his disciples, so he says to the church, to you and I, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That word authority, you know what it means? It means power. It means complete control. You see, church family, be reminded today that Jesus Christ is in charge of everything. He is in charge of everything that is going on in the world. He's in control. He's even in control of your life. And if Jesus can handle all that is going on in the world, He can handle anything that you are facing today. Jesus Christ, He gives hope for today. He provides, He protects, He cares about the smallest details of your life. All things are possible with Jesus. Nothing is beyond Him. He can handle anything. Jesus gives hope for today. So may we pray the same prayer for each other and over our lives that Paul prayed for the church in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. That word abound, it means to have more than enough. And by the power of the Holy Spirit that is dwelling inside of you, you have more than enough hope. And that hope is offered to you and I through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Next, write this down. As Jesus Christ gives hope for today, He also gives hope for tomorrow. He also gives hope for tomorrow. One of my favorite movies growing up was the movie Back to the Future. Anybody ever remember seeing that incredible movie? I love that series of movies. You know, they could, they could jump in that, that car, I think it was called the DeLorean, was that right? The DeLorean? He could jump in that car, and they could go all the way into the past. They could go all the way into the future, and I would just remember watching that movie. And even, even today, as a, as a grown adult, thinking to myself, how cool would it be to have a DeLorean to be able to go back, you know, into the past or to be able to go into the future and to see what's going on in the future. How cool would that be? But, unfortunately, we cannot time travel. I've already tried it. And we just cannot do it. You see, we have no clue what tomorrow holds. We have no clue what tomorrow holds, but guess what? Jesus Christ is the one who holds tomorrow. He's already there. He's already seen tomorrow. He knows what tomorrow holds. Why? What's that mean for us? Understanding that, that we understand that Jesus Christ holds tomorrow in his hand, this is why it's so important for us today to hold, hold on to Jesus. He already understands tomorrow. He already sees what's going to happen tomorrow. He's already been there. That's why it's so important for us today to cling to Jesus, to hold on to the Son of God every single day of our lives. He already understands tomorrow. The writer of Hebrews says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You see, because Jesus Christ gives hope for tomorrow, we must hold fast to him today. So it begs this question, how do we do this? How can you and I, how can we hold fast to Jesus Christ today? Did you know that we need each other to hold fast to Jesus Christ? I'm going to say that again. You and I, those of you who are watching online who couldn't make it today, we need each other to hold fast to Jesus Christ. This verse that I just read, let me explain what I'm talking about here. This verse that I just read, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, the writer says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. And this verse, Hebrews 10, 23, is in context of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. What's that verse? Well, let me read it for you. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. Then the writer goes on to say, in context, let us consider 
how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, church family, we hold fast to the confession of our hope by encouraging one another. That's what this text is saying. And I understand that this year it's been difficult for us. COVID-19 has made it very difficult for us to be able to together, and we completely understand that. We understand the circumstances. But we can all still encourage each other in our hope. How? Well, when we can, when the circumstances allow, by meeting together safely. But at the same time, in today's age of technology, we can encourage each other in our hope by jumping on a phone and calling a brother or sister in Christ just to encourage them in their walk with Christ. We can jump on a phone and send a text to encourage a brother or sister in Christ to encourage them in their hope. We can jump on a phone or an iPad and we can talk to people face to face through this really cool thing called FaceTime. How many of you ever use that? We do almost every single day in our house. You see, we can still encourage one another in our hope during this time, during this crazy time of COVID-19. So here is the question that I have for myself, for all of this, for all of us who are in this room, and even for those of you who are participating with us online today. Here is the question. How are you doing your part in your church family to encourage others to hold fast to the confession of their hope. How are you encouraging your brother and sister in Christ during this time? And not just during this time, but all times. We hold fast to the confession of our hope by encouraging one another to do so. Jesus Christ, he gives hope for tomorrow and he uses the church to encourage each other to hold fast to that hope. Jesus Christ gives hope for tomorrow. Next, you can write this truth down. Jesus Christ gives hope for eternity. He gives hope for today. He gives hope for tomorrow. And he gives hope for eternity. You see, what separates Christianity from all other religions is that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. If Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead, we would have zero hope. That's what Paul says. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But he says, In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He gives us hope because he has been risen from the dead. Christ has been risen from the dead. We have hope for eternal life through him. 1 Thessalonians 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That means those who have passed away. That you may not grieve as others, who, others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or those who have passed away. You see, when a loved one passes away who is in Christ, we do not grieve like those who have no hope. We can grieve with hope hope that we will one day see them again. Jesus Christ gives hope for eternity, and we are waiting for his return. Look at these verses. Where the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope. You see, we're waiting on his return the appearing of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous to do good works. Titus 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. You see, Jesus gives hope for eternity. Peter calls believers in Christ 
to worship God because of the hope that He gives. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's that? That's worship. He says, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, Jesus Christ. He gives hope for eternity. And we have this hope by calling on His name. As Jesus Christ says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Him. Except through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives hope for eternity. So what do these truths mean for us? These great truths that we see in the Word of God that maybe some of you are being reminded of or maybe some of you have, are hearing for the very first time that Jesus came to give hope, that He gives hope for today, tomorrow, and for eternity. What does this mean for us today? I want you to write these truths down and to live these truths out. This Advent season and every season, and these are a lot like last week, rest in the hope that Jesus gives. Can I just be honest with you? This first point, well, not just this first one, all of them, but really this first point, it's for me. And I think it's for you as well. How many of us need to be reminded today just to rest in the hope of our God? What does this mean? I think it means to relax. I think it means to trust, to have faith. I think it means to be still. Rest in the hope that Jesus gives. I want to encourage you. If you're watching online or for those of you who are in this room today, I want to encourage you to do something for me right now. I just want to encourage you just to close your eyes. And I want you to listen to this verse. It's a verse that you've heard many times. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can open your eyes. I don't want you guys falling asleep. Rest in the hope that Jesus gives. Son of God, daughter of God, child of God, the king of the universe is on your side. He is with you. He is fighting for you. He knows about your situation. He knows about 2020. He knows about every detail of your life. Commit it to the Lord Give it over to the Lord and rest in Him. Next. What else can we do this Advent season and every season? Give the hope of Jesus Christ to someone else. I think we all know people, we all have people in our lives who desperately need Jesus, who desperately need the gospel. I would encourage you to start praying for them, to ask God to give you a spirit-led opportunity to talk to them about Jesus, to talk to them about the faith and the hope that you have. Ask God for bring up, to bring up an opportunity. Ask God to bring someone into your life that needs the hope of the gospel. And I guarantee you when you pray that, when you ask God to give you opportunities to talk with someone about the hope that you have within you, God will bring up those opportunities. You see, church family, we are a sent people. We have been given this great commission to go and to take this hope to the world, to our neighbors, to the nations, to everywhere we go. Give the hope of Jesus Christ to someone else. Number three, what else, how else can we apply this 
these great truths to our lives. Number three, receive the hope of Jesus. Maybe you're in this place today or you're, you're watching online and you've never placed your faith and your hope and your trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sin, calling on his name for salvation. You see, the greatest gift that you could possibly receive this Christmas and every single Christmas is the hope of eternal life only offered through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Would you receive the hope of Jesus? And lastly, what should we do because of the hope that Jesus Christ gives us, this, this sureness that we can have full joy and complete confidence in? What should we do? We should worship. Worship Jesus because of the hope he gives. Would you pray with me today? Maybe you're in this place today or you're watching online and you've never received the hope of Jesus. Why do you need to do that? Well, the Bible tells us this, that we've all sinned. What's sin? It's mistakes, it's mess-ups, it's, it's mis things that we've done in our lives. The Bible says that we've all made these mistakes, and the Bible also says that because of our sin, we fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we cannot measure up to God. We cannot measure up to God's standard of holiness. And the only way that we can have our sin forgiven is by placing our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ. It's his finished work on the cross and the fact that he was resurrected from the grave. It's that story that we tell at Easter that Jesus Christ came and lived a, a perfect life and he was crucified on a cross and three days later he rose from the grave. It's placing our faith and our hope and our trust in that, in his finished work. And you can do that today. Maybe you're watching online or you're in this place today and you've never placed your faith and your hope in Christ for eternal life. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And today, this very moment, right now, if you don't have that sureness in your heart that you had the hope of Christ, call on him now to save you. You could pray a prayer like this, but mean it from the depths of your heart. God, I understand that I, I'm a sinner. And I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I ask that Jesus would be the guide and the boss and the leader of my life. And I commit my life to follow him from this point forward. And the Bible tells us this, that if you declare that today from the depths of your heart and meant it from the depths of your heart, that you now have this hope, that you have the hope of eternal life that you have received the hope of Jesus. And if you've done that today, I encourage you to tell someone, to tell me, to tell somebody in this church, because the next step for you is to follow Jesus Christ in what we call believer's baptism. It's an act of obedience where we come into the waters to identify ourselves with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's how we tell the world and proclaim to the world that we are a believer in Christ. Would you tell somebody today if you've made that decision to follow Jesus? Maybe 2020 has been a crazy year for you. Can I just ask you to do something by faith for me? Take 2020 and put it in the palm of your hands and all that's going on, all that you're concerned about, and by faith, open the palm of your hands up and say, God, I give this to you. I'm going to rest in the hope that you give. God, we love you. And today we worship you because of Christ, because of the sureness that we have in him. We have complete joy and complete confidence in him, his authority, his power, his dominion, his rule, his reign, in the salvation that he offers, and we rest in that today. And therefore, because of Christ, we give you worship. We worship. We love you, God, we love you. Thank you so much for the sureness of your Son, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Church family, would you stand to your feet? Right now, we're just going to sing a song of worship back to our God, declaring that He is the living hope. Would you sing this out? Would you give Him worship because of the hope that He gives today? <laughs>